6 of the judgment. Uh, and uh, very briefly, before I go um, specifically to the components of that paragraph, might I ask um, the Lordship just to take up um, a couple of uh, relevant uh, citings in the authorities. Uh, you did ask, was Australia on in the context of Harold, to which I've already referred you to, as to whether uh, there was um, a NPPF edition in play at the time. There was, uh, which has effectively the same, very similar wording. It's on divider 18 of the authorities bundle at page 421. And how you will recall is the case concerning the statutory duty in the context of the North of Broads, that's the 1988 Act which set it up. And uh, the broad statutory duty um, was dealt with from paragraphs 37 uh, onwards. And uh, planning policy was dealt with from paragraph 50 onwards. And paragraph 52 on page 41 uh, makes reference to the NPPF. And of course, this decision was November 2014, the first edition of the NPPF 2012. And it was dealing with paragraph uh, 116, which, uh, in essence, the first part thereof was in virtually identical phraseology to that in paragraph 176. It didn't deal with setting, though. So that's uh, what the first part. Um, uh, the next part, uh, that I, next authority I'd like to take you to is Bayliss. Um, which we cite in our skeleton as relevant to the great weight um, issue, as it were, and indeed referenced in the judgment of the time of the authorities bundle. That is at Defiler 3 of the authorities bundle, dealt with an internal wind farm in Dorset. Uh, and just for uh, clarity's sake, if you go to paragraph 12 of the judgment of this court, stated below by stated Keane. Um, paragraph 115, and so far as it is relevant, on page 43 of the bundle, paragraph 12 of the judgment, you will see there that uh, the first element of that is in um, virtually identical terms, but more importantly, it addresses great weight. I then ask you to turn forward uh, on this. Sorry, um, you've got paragraph 115, great weight. The inspector does not expressly refer to that exactly. paragraph. Exactly, my lord. Um, and but it uh, acknowledges that express reference is not required. So long yeah. as it can be seen, the inspector adopted in the substance the approach there set out. And if, if one goes forward in the judgment, my lord, to paragraph 17, what that what is uh, then contained in the judgment is the various references where the inspector dealt with matters appertaining to the issues in dispute uh, and the court asked the rhetorical question so one has to ask in the light of those passages and where do they ask that? Uh, that's paragraph, paragraph 17 of the judgment 17, thank you. Yeah. the starting point uh, is that he expressly states in paragraph 7 of his decision he has had regard to the submissions made by the parties about the framework um, therefore insofar as reliance was placed upon Buck's the objection group it's to be assumed that he took account of that guidance unless the decision letter clearly indicates otherwise and for my part I cannot see that there is any such contrary indication in the decision letter there is no doubt he was not required to use the words great weight as if it were some form of incantation. That was the phrase I was echoing earlier on today when I um, made a reference in similar terms. Mr. Edwards accepts that. Moreover, the national policy guidance, very brief in nature on this point, has to be interpreted in the light of the obvious point that the effect of a proposal on an AONB, that's an area of outstanding national duty will itself vary. It will vary from case to case. It may be trivial, it may be substantial, it may be major. The decision maker is entitled to attach different weights to this factor depending upon the degree of harmful impact anticipated 
Indeed, in my view, it would be irrational to do otherwise. The adjective great in the term great weight therefore does not take one very far. Had the inspector here, the inspector found the impact on the adjacent part, and I stress the fact that this would be adjacent part of the A and B would, uh, would be limited. And uh, so <coughs> that was, of course, dealing with an A or N D. Um, that again, in this case, my lord, before I turn to that, uh, those paragraphs of the judgment, um, the statutory duty, um, as we indicated uh, earlier, is to have regard to those objectives which are repeated in effect in. Um, the first sentence of paragraph 176 of the framework. There's no statutory duty, unlike heritage, um, heritage assets, uh, to have a special regard. And uh, there was no um, requirement um, to state great weight. Ultimately, this will be a matter for the inspector. And then one turns to the judgment in answer to your question that were posed before the break, my lord. And I ask you to turn up judgment, paragraph 154. Do you, mean, <coughs> do you mean the decision or do you mean the judgment? No, the judgment, my lord. I'm going to be going between the... Yep. And the first part, I, I'd ask you to have your as it were, finger on the uh, decision as well, um, because... What we say is quite clear that uh, the question posed in the judgment was the inspector erred in law and failing to take into account his finding at decision letter 47 that the level of harm would be moderate, adverse, and not significant in the overall planning balance. My Lord, in that context, I would now ask you to look at the uh, decision because you say that's incorrect. Under the significant number of paragraphs dealing with landscape, but specifically under the heading of setting of the National Park and the views from within it, at paragraphs 44 to 48, there the inspector is taking into account or assessing the impacts in accordance with those identified objectives that were discussed before him, and then he reaches his conclusion at 49. And uh, in that, he makes express reference to paragraph 176. There's no requirement upon him to uh, include any incantation at that effect, at that stage, uh, or indeed we would say at any stage, to indicate that great weight had to be given to those objectives, he would have been familiar with those and they would have been factored into his assessment in the preceding paragraph. Thereafter, again, when he's considering the flaws that were alleged before the judge below, uh, in his overall conclusions at paragraph 57 of the decision letter, the inspector under, the, uh, under that heading uh, indicates Really, he's drawing all those threads together. He does not consider the proposed development would materially affect the setting of Flag Downs National Park or the other issue. That would be in the context of the objective. It isn't the case that his finding of adverse visual impacts, which he described as moderate adverse, necessarily means the objectives are materially uh, impacted. Uh, because he considered the second part of the framework policy was complied with. Um, he then uh, carries that forward as part of the overall planning balance into paragraph 84 when he talks about visual receptors. And uh, the importance, uh, very briefly before I conclude, my Lord, of the visual receptors is that... The LVIA was all in the context of visual receptors. Well, he's 
says, I afford them only moderate weight. Yes, well, he can give them, if you look at Bayliss, of course, and what is called said in Bayliss, great weight is not an incantation, and it doesn't take you very much, very much further. But what is clear when one looks at 84 is that he had brought forward his conclusions of 57 to paragraph 84. The visual receptors can only be, because landscape impact is a visual impact, um, it can only be in the context of visual receptors, as was made clear in the proof of evidence of Mr. Self, which I've already referred you to that paragraph, and it is cited um, uh, is cited in the judgment. It was for your note, um, page 84 of the supplementary bundle. But then taking those threads together, if one then goes to the judgment, um, uh, paragraph 154 uh, of the judgment of the court below, it's clear that the inspector did take those matters into account. He did take 176 into account, and he gave ultimately that uh, those adverse impacts a moderate weight, as we can see from paragraph 84. Uh, and one of the other matters that I think is important um, is the alleged step that was missed, which we say wasn't. If you go into the judgment below, the judge said the approach, of course, is standard practice and decision making. Uh, I won't say much about that. I mean, uh, um, it's uh, clear that. He didn't, in fact, um, ignore 176. But the point here made that mm. the inspector missed out the step despite the fact that it was flagged to him in a council's closing submissions. It indicate earlier on, my lord, that uh, that was not the case. And it is important, I think, for you to take, be taken to paragraph 99 of the closing submissions because that is specifically referenced uh, in the judgment. And Where that is, is it? at Divider 19, mm -hmm. page 166. Electronic bundle, it's 183. All oh, right. Oh. The PDF doesn't coincide. But 23 pages out by this point. I do apologize. Right. Of course, that time submission time. was made on the basis of the council's case that the harm was substantial, um, which was the conflict that the inspector had to um, reconcile. Um, my lady, yes, that, that, yeah, that, that's that, their, that was their case at that stage. They said it was substantial harm to the landscape. He finds there's right. any moderate harm to the landscape. He, he, he explicitly said, I disagree with the yeah. council. But, but of course, the, the point in the judgment is the um, judge said the inspector missed out the set despite the fact it was flagged to him in the council's mm -hmm. closing submissions, paragraph 99, and Mr. Hutchison's evidence to which I've taken you, taken you mm -hmm. before. And what Mr. Hutchinson said, the way in which I'm presenting it, obviously give great weight to the objectives. Um, but then he, Mr. Hutchison, uh, afforded moderate weight actually to the harm in view of the conclusions that Mr. Self, the appellant uh, landscape witness, um, reached. That's more and or less what's said in paragraph 100 okay. of these submissions. Yes, my lord. Oh, sorry, yes, uh, that's great, but to moderate. Uh, so, yes, exactly. That's. that's uh, that's the point, though, that the submission um, that was made, uh, and by reference to Mr. Hutchison's evidence, Mr. Mm. Hutchison's evidence was a case that was clearly um, adopted by the inspector. So it would necessarily have encompassed the requirements of paragraph 176. What do you 
you say about what's said in the hundred, where the, the point is made that even if it's any moderate harm, you have to give the moderate harm great weight? Well, the, um, the point that was there made was great weight must be afforded to whatever level of heritage harm. Um, it was applying or seeking to apply the same test as for heritage assets. That was actually rejected by the judge in the uh, court below. Because, of course, it doesn't have an express statutory duty. So what was rejected? The, the, the same approach to heritage assets um, as, it, as for Brands Hill should be adopted with regard to uh, great weight in the context of paragraph 174. Right. Because, of course, with heritage assets, there is that statutory duty money. Uh, sorry, if I'm being slow, forgive me. Was um, Bayless cited to the inspector? No. My recollection is no, but I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong. I, I think my learned friend is uh, agreeing. It, it was not. It was not. No. And Monk Hill, that was not cited before the inspector either. Because I think in Monk Hill, I, I agreed with what the bailiff had said in part of his judgment. Uh, you did. Yes. In Monk Hill, of course, that was with the tilted balance and whether footnote seven, yeah. um, it concerned, obviously, as you would be familiar, my lord, it concerned a development within the AOMB and whether footnote, footnote seven was engaged or could be engaged. No, it wasn't. The issue here was not actually the issue in Monk Hill. No, no, no it wasn't. And I, 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 I have referenced Monk Hill yeah. uh, in my skeleton, but in essence, my lord, so then one. When one looks at... Well, so, so, sorry, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Cairns. Can, can you look at 138 of the judgment? So she actually says in 138 that she is bound not to follow... Um, that she's bound to follow Davis and, and not to um, apply need to apply great weight even to the moderate harm. Is that what she says there? Am I reading that correctly? No, well, she says there, the reasoning in Bayliss differs from that in heritage cases. So uh, in heritage cases, whatever the level of harm, you still have to uh, accord considerable weight in the balancing exercise. Whereas in Bayliss, it's what weight you give to any harm the exercise is enough for the decision maker. You don't have to go through that process. And as I indicated just a short while ago, my learned friend submitted that the same analysis should apply uh, to that requirement to give great weight in paragraph 176, but uh, the judge declined to. Right, but then, I mean, sh sh I'm, I'm just asking, Mr. Hmm. Kenz, do you say that having said she wasn't going to do that, she then says you have to do that at paragraph well, one? Well, well, Five, uh, four. In effect, that uh, that is what she did. I, I respectfully submit, because she says paragraph ninety-nine, by which we'll take it. She means paragraph she means a hundred. Yeah, that was my mistake. Um, uh, but uh, yes, in effect, that's what she was required. That that was the flaw she said, the principal flaw in the decision letter, where she had earlier uh, acknowledged that um, that. Uh, it was different to the heritage case. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Kenz. I, 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 forgive me for interrupting you, but that's not how I read paragraph 154. Paragraph 154 is not saying um, that you've got to give great weight to the harm, whatever level the harm is. Paragraph 154 is criticising the inspector, rightly or wrongly, for failing to take into account in the planning balance the level of harm that he had assessed and weighing that against the benefits of the development. That's the criticism she's making there. Um, and looking at the, the, the guidance in the other cases. But as I, I read that paragraph, um, let Mrs. Mrs. Justice Lang is not saying you've always got to give great weight, contrary to what's said in, ba in Bayless. Um, sorry, my lady. Uh, well, our first point, our point on that, though, is that, um, in fact, uh, we did for the reasons yes. sorry, the inspector did 
Sorry, I, 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 I understand I your point is that, that, that that's an unfair criticism because the inspector, in fact, did take it into account in the planning balance. Um, but I didn't understand you to be submitting that having said uh, in her judgment earlier, um, I've got to follow Bayliss, I'm not going to accept Miss Tuffle's uh, uh, argument by an analogy with heritage assets. She then went and did precisely what she said she wasn't going to do. But speaking for myself, I don't think she did. Certainly not in Power 154. Um, for what it's worth, I at least provisionally agree. Um, but you've given the overriding answer already, which is that you say that the harm was actually weighed, yeah. and and within the, if you like, the parameters, the broad parameters set by Sir David in Bayliss, uh, he sets a very broad spectrum of potential harm, acknowledging that the policy says great weight. Mm. Um, and, and your submission is that when you look at the passages you've connected, 49, 57, mm. and 84, um, to say nothing of 91, um, it's evident that the inspector did what was required of him. That's your submission, I think. Uh, it, it is. It is. But I think you also say that the, the analysis that you put on that in convocation, I, I, I wouldn't see it. No, but Mr. Kens, you, you do say, as I understand it, that the mistake in paragraph 154 is the last sentence. Because if she's wrong in the first sentence, that he had not taken into account the moderate harm, then it is wrong to say there was another step because she'd already said at 142 or whatever it was, there wasn't. But you had to take it into account and give it great weight. If he did, which is what you're saying, mm -hmm. then there wasn't another step that he missed out. And it, it is wrong also to say in 55 that he didn't give any weight to the moderate adverse effect. That's the whole question. Uh, and we say that he did. Yeah, you say he did, and that's the question. Either he did or he didn't. I mean, and that's the, the conflict, really, between paragraphs 47 and 49. You, the other side, I think you would say, say that he'd forgotten 47 when he wrote 49, and you say, well, that's silly. In essence, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. But, uh, my Lord, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't summarize it any more shortly than that, but uh, that is, in essence, your point on this. Um, on this now, um, I fear, having not followed the skeleton uh, as is the norm in such circumstances, that uh, um, I fear, I believe I've covered everything that I wish to cover. Uh, your lordships and ladyships uh, will have read the skeleton anyway, but um, unless there's anything specific on any of the submissions that we make in respect to ground one and ground two, um, I think those two will put it down. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Ms. Tuffle. <coughs> My Lords, I wonder if I might at the outset just turn to some of the factual material that was before the inspector, because that's plainly relevant to the way in which the parties understood the principal controversial issues. And I won't uh, trespass over matters we've already looked at, but there are some pertinent documents I say that we haven't looked at so far. Um, the first I'd like to turn to is the evidence of the appellant's planning witness, Mr. Hutchinson. Now, we have some of those extracts behind tab 11, but the extract I wish to refer to was not behind tab 11, and I provided it separately by email. And it's also in a white folder, which I handed up this morning, which uh, I think um, now I know my Lord the Master of the Rolls doesn't have I've, this I've got it. Um, in hard copy um, but for those that do it's behind tab one um, and it's the first page of Mr. H that extract of Mr. Hutchison's proof of evidence um, and it's paragraph 4.9 sorry 7.9 so we see there that, that Mr. Hutchison is discussing the first of the inspector's two main issues. Um, and he breaks them down into a number of discrete issues, which he then goes on to address separately in his evidence. The first is whether the appeal site offers an appropriate location for development having regard to the local plan and national policy, 
that is the adopted local plan. The second, whether the appeal site offers an appropriate location for development having regard to the emerging plan. And the third is prematurity. And I say it's apparent from uh, this and other documents that we'll look at that the parties understood reasons for refusal one and two to raise a number of discrete issues. Appropriateness against local plan, appropriateness against the emerging plan, prematurity. Turning then to the way the council put its uh, case before the inspector. I would accept, to... wouldn't you, sorry to interrupt you, yes. but you would accept that there's a degree of overlap yes. between issues two and three. My lady, I would. There, yeah. there is a degree of overlap, um, but they were discreet. discreet. Um, and one sees that reflected in the way the council put its case in closing submissions, that supplementary bundle behind tab 19 from page 143. So main issues one and two are addressed together, but one sees, um, beginning on page 144, There's a subheading, Worthing Core Strategy. And the council made submissions as to the appropriateness of development having regard to adopted policy, first by assessing conflict, and one sees the subheading there. And then moving on to page 146. There's a subheading right at the bottom of that page, weight to attribute to the conflict with the adopted plan. And then, Page 149, there's a subheading, Emerging Local Plan, a sub subheading, Conflict, and then page 153, a further subheading, Weight to Attribute to the Conflict. And then from page 157, a subheading, prematurity. There's then the appellant's closing submissions, which are behind tab 20. Um, and if we turn to page 179, There's a subheading on page 175. Main issue one, acceptable location having regard to local national policy need for housing and emerging local plan. And then paragraph 6.1 to 6.9, over pages 175 to 9, they address the adopted local plan. And then from Paris 6.10 to 6.14, they address the emerging local plan. And then page 181, separate subheading, prematurity. That's just the structure of the approach taken by the parties, and I will come back to the, the actual points raised in those documents and the evidence in, in a moment. Um, but with that context then in mind, ground one is addressed from paragraph 14 of our skeleton argument, and the judge found that the inspector failed to take account of policies SS1 and 4, and that he failed to provide any adequate reasons. And as we've seen, one of the key issues for the inspector to, to determine was whether the appeal site was an appropriate location having regard to emerging policy. And that required consideration of whether the scheme was in accordance with relevant policies of the emerging plan and the weight to attribute to those policies.
Now, I recognise at the outset that policy SS1 was not referred to in the reason for refusal or in the Council's uh, evidence of its planning witness. That was corrected in the Statement of Common Ground, which was produced after the proofs of evidence. And my lady has already um, pointed to the relevant paragraph, which for your notes is Supplementary Bundle, tab 16, page 125, paragraph 7.15. And I would like, like to ask your lordships, please, also to turn up um, the appellant's now, the now appellant's detailed grounds for resistance in the High Court, which is in the core bundle, page 95. My learned friend um, includes an extract from the Statement of Common Ground in 3.1, and then at 3.2 says, in addition, the parties' respective positions regarding policy SS1 of the emerging local plan were fully canvassed and addressed in their evidence presented to the inquiry. Indeed, that was so. Compliance or otherwise with SS1 and the weight to attribute to that <coughs> was indeed fully <coughs> explored during the inquiry, and that was because the question of whether the appeal site was an appropriate location for development having <coughs> regard to the emerging local plan involved consideration of policy SS1 as well as 4 and 5. Those policies were part of a spatial strategy in the plan, which directed development to certain locations and away from others. <coughs> and they were key to answering the question of whether the proposed development was in an appropriate location, having regard to the emerging local plan. And I'd like to turn briefly, if I may, to the emerging local plan, which is in the supplementary bundle behind tab six. to look at a number of paragraphs of the text to the emerging local plan is in response to the suggestion that these policies simply continued policy 13 of the adopted core strategy um, and to look at the way um, that they were expressed in the explanatory text, which I say shows that they were quite clearly the product of a fresh balancing exercise undertaken in the context of the MPPF, which had been adopted and updated various times since the core strategy was adopted, and in full recognition of the housing needs and the constraints facing Worthing. And with that in mind, I would ask your Lordships please to read paragraphs 3.8 to 10 of the explanatory text of policy SS1.
acknowledges the similarities with the previous plan, but it makes it clear that uh, times have moved on. It does, my lady. It expressly refers to the MPCS at 3.9, yeah. uh, the council's response to the need to meet as much of the housing need as possible. 3.10 talks about striking the right balance between meeting those needs and protecting and enhancing the borough's high quality environment. Um, then there's the policy wording, which we've already looked at, and I won't go over again. Um, and then if one turns into onto page 16, there's a subheading, developing a target for housing delivery. And under that, paragraph 313 explains that the MPPF now requires local planning authorities to meet their full need for market and affordable housing insofar as consistent with the framework, how the policies of the framework. That's 313. Three fifteen explains that in line with the framework, the council has sought to plan positively to establish whether housing delivery could be increased, increased significantly to help close the gap between the level of identified need and historic delivery rate. And paragraph 316 explains that the council's strategic housing land availability assess assessment has provided the mechanism to assess the quantity and suitability of land for housing development. And 317 explains that this new plan um, allocates two forms of additional uh, sites for housing not included in the adopted local plan. One is brownfield sites within the built-up area boundary. Um, and the other, I'm afraid, missing from the bundle, um, but we can turn to it in the judgment if necessary, is that a, an additional six sites had been allocated on the edge of Worthing as part of the new local plan and the built-up area boundary had been amended to include those sites. So the built-up area boundary wasn't just a continuation from the local plan, it had been amended. So two points to note here. The first is that adopted policy 13, which we have behind tab 5, um, and it's page 12, was expressly predicated on the understanding that new development needs could be met within the existing built-up area boundaries. And that's recorded in the introductory words to the policy in bold. By contrast, the emerging policies were expressly predicated on an understanding that Worthing would not be able to meet its housing requirements within the built-up area boundary but that the spatial strategy they encompassed was nonetheless appropriate to protect those of Worthing's assets that were considered worthy of protection. And the judge recognised, um, as was agreed in the Statement of Common Ground, that it would never be possible for Worthing to meet its full housing needs in light of the updated housing requirement, even if every blade of grass in Worthing was to be allocated for housing. And the, the judge's conclusions on um, this effectively simplex point um, are at 101 to 105, her judgment. And it's, it's not just relevant to simplex, because it's also relevant to the reasons and the standard of reasoning required. Because my learned friend says, well, the council's position was simply that the emerging local policies continued the effect of CS13, and so there was no need to refer again to those points specifically. And I'll come and look at that in a moment. Um, but I would ask your lordships to look again carefully at 101 to 5 of the judgment. A second point to note is that whilst policies SS4 and 5 were subject to proposed amendments at the time of the inquiry, which is set out in Mrs Justice Lang's judgment, policy SS1 was not. It had not been the subject of comment by the local plan inspector in his post-hearing advice letter, which was behind tab 10, and
and no modifications were proposed to it as the judge recorded at paragraph 94 of her judgment. My Lord, Lord Justice Lindblom asked before lunch what form the final adopted local plan had taken. Um, on that, policy SS1, well, effectively, there was no change material to this site, to this scheme. Policy SS1 um, had been changed a minor degree in that one of the sites that had previously been allocated for housing had been deleted. And policy SS4, there was some amendment to the exception to the general policy um, about development outside the built-up area boundaries, which related to first-time buyer uh, exception sites. So nothing, they, they were materially the same as the version in set out in the judgment for the purposes of this site. So turning to the ways those policies were addressed by the parties, I'd ask your lordships to turn to supplementary bundle tab 11, again to the proof of evidence of Mr Hutchison, just to look in a little more detail. So this is under the heading issue, his issue two, we see this on page 36, whether the appeal site offers an appropriate location for development having regard to the emerging local plan. On page 38, para 7.78, he discusses the weights to the emerging local plan. Sorry, seven what? 7.78, my lord. And he says it should attract no more than limited weight. On page 41, paragraph 7.83, he repeats his conclusion that the emerging local plan should be afforded limited weight, but then he explains that he's going to go on and deal with the proposal against the emerging policies um, set out in the draft local plan. And he runs through them. The first is SS1, which he addresses from paragraph 7.85. At paragraph 7.86, he says the appeal site will be in general accordance with this urban focus strategy because it's located immediately adjacent to the built-up area in, in an accessible location. General accordance with SS1 was the appellant's case. 7.87 then, he appears to um, suggest that there's an inconsistency between policy SS1 and the framework, which plainly is a matter that would go to the weight to be afforded to policy SS1. The appellant there saying that should reduce the weight it attracts. Paragraph 7.88 to 7.90. Still in the context of SS1 here, he recognises the appeal site isn't allocated for development but says very little weight should be attributed to that. Paragraph 7.91, he turns to policy SS4. Um, and he says 7.92 firstly, Given the housing land supply position, this policy cannot be, to, uh, cannot be a bar to development that cannot be located elsewhere. Parent 7.93, um, he discusses the proposed modifications to the policy. And then Para 7.130, he summarises the position, emerging local plan can be afforded no more than limited weight at this time. And just to complete on the appellant's case, turning to the appellant's closing submissions, which are behind tab 20. Page 
0.183 and your lordships will no doubt notice that, that the language that my learned friend and I adopted in our closing submissions um, before the inspectorate can sometimes be somewhat more colourful than in our submissions to this court um, and no criticism of that but this, this was a reflection of the appellant's case the appellant at 8.3 of its closing submissions described the suggestion that the emerging local plan should be afforded significant weight as extraordinary. And para 8.5, uh, the appellant said that to afford weight to the emerging local plan at the top end of the scale, i.e. significant, would be nonsensical. So the appellant's case quite clearly limited weight and to afford significant weight would be nonsensical and extraordinary. The council submissions um, are behind tab 19 of the supplementary bundle. I'd ask your lordships to turn to um, paragraph 28. Well, paragraph 27 introduces policy SS1 and paragraph 28 says the appeal scheme does not comply with any aspect of the strategy. So which page are you on? Apologies, my lord, it's 149. Is that 149 in the page? It's, it's in the hard copy, I'm afraid I don't have the PDF numbers. If it helps, it's in... No, no, it's all right, I, I can you. add 23 on. Good at maths. <laughs> I'm grateful, my lord, I'm not. Um, so it's 27 introduces policy SS1. 28 says the appeal scheme doesn't comply with any aspect of that strategy and cannot credibly be said to be in general accordance with the strategy in the emerging local plan. And there's a footnote and there's reference to Mr. Hutchison's proof, which we just looked at. Um, then page 150. Paragraphs um, 39, no, so page 150 um, discusses SS4 and paragraph 32 says the appeal scheme is in conflict with policy SS4. And if one looks, because our closing submissions drew a distinction between conflict and then weight, so then if one turns into page 153, paragraph 41. Policies SS14 and 5 are material considerations of significant weight, and then there's an explanation over the following pages as to why they should be afforded significant weight. Uh, finally, on this point, the statement of common ground, please. Um, which is supplementary bundle tab 16. Page 126. Paragraph 7.24. This is setting out the matters that were uh, not agreed. Um, the weight to be afforded to the emerging local plan for the purposes of this appeal is a matter in dispute. Yeah. And if one turns into page 127, which is a table of not agreed matters in which each party set out their respective position, there's a heading in the left-hand column, the emerging local plan. The next column sets out the appellant's position, and one sees at the bottom of that page the appellant's position limited weight. And in the next column, it's the council summarising its position. Final sentence, significant weight. So the third column presumably defines the issue. Yes. 
which of course is separate from the next page which defines the issue of prematurity exactly. in the tests. Yes. The next page discusses prematurity, yeah. again, um, the respective positions of the parties set out. Yeah. Now, in my learner friend's skeleton argument, paragraphs 55 to 57, um, he alleges that the learned judge was factually wrong to conclude that the inspector had failed to give proper consideration to policies SS1 and 4. And we respond to that in paragraph 16 to 23 of our skeleton argument. Um, and I'd like to turn up the decision letter, please, um, which is in the core bundle, beginning on page 217. And one sees from page 218, within the reasons there are various subheadings and discrete issues considered. The first is location and green space, and the inspector looks first at the adopted local plan. And he notes at paragraph 14 that when the core strategy was adopted, it was considered that all of Worthing's development requirements could be delivered within the existing golf up area boundary. So we just have a look at that. Um, from 17, DL 17, decision letter paragraph 17, he discusses housing need, which was a matter of agreement between the parties. And from paragraph 22, he discusses together the emerging local plan and prematurity. So, at paragraph 24, he discusses effectively paragraph 47 of the MVPF. He sets out the matters identified there which are relevant to the weight to attribute to emerging policies. At 25, he notes that the emerging local plan is at a relatively advanced stage. But he notes the inspector has made a number of comments in relation to SS4 to 6, um, not to SS1, because that hadn't been subject to comment. So he then goes on to, con to consider what weight he should attribute to those policies in light of those matters. At 26, he says no weight to policy SS6, and that was agreed because at the time of the inquiry, the inspector had uh, suggested that Chapsmall Farm was an extensive tract of land, and so it shouldn't be designated as a green space. And the council at the inquiry accepted that and didn't pursue a case on conflict with SS6. So no weight to SS5. Then he goes on at paragraph 27, to, no wait sorry, to SS6. SS6, apologies. Paragraph 27, he turns to SS5. And he says, well, it's subject to, um, well, he discusses the policy's purposes about the gap and visual separation. A number of main modifications are proposed to ensure its effectiveness and provide internal consistency with SS4 and 6. Don't, over, don't affect the overall aims of policy SS5 but it's unclear what form the final policy will take. That limits the weight that should be afforded. So limited weight to SS5, no weight to SS6. Then he goes on furthermore, and he addresses a separate issue of prematurity. I'm pausing there for a moment. So we know that he's found limited weight, limited weight to the conflict with SS5. And if one then looks at his overall planning balance, which begins on page 229, subheading overall planning balance. In this section, he's drawing together all of the adverse impacts and the benefits that he's identified in the preceding section, sections. And at paragraph 83, I've also found there'd be some potential conflict with emerging policy SS5. This is where he's identifying the harms. Um, but for the reasons discussed above, he affords it only limited weight. So he makes the finding, 
paragraph 27, limited weight. Paragraph 83, he weighs that in the balance as a factor militating against the grant of permission. What you say is obviously missing is any similar discussion of SL4, let alone SL, SS1. I do. And as, as, as uh, Mrs Justice Lang said at paragraph 93 to 4 of her judgment, this approach in respect of SS5 was precisely what was required in respect of SS1 and 4. First identify where there's conflict, then determine the weight to attribute to it, and then weigh that conflict subject to the weight he considered appropriate mm -hmm. in the planning balance. And it was plainly a significant matter in dispute between the parties whether those policies should be afforded limited or significant weight. Nowhere in the inspector's decision letter is there any mention of policy SS1, and nor is there any finding in respect of conflict or otherwise with SS4 or the weight to attribute to that policy. Now, I accept there are references to SS4 at paragraphs 25 and 27 of the decision letter, but they are rightly described by the learner judge below as passing references which don't explain um, how the inspector determined that key issue between the parties. So, turning back to the section we were at before, which is on page 221, where we've got to paragraph 28 of the decision letter, which begins with the word furthermore. Um, and in my submission, at paragraphs 28 to 30, the inspector is plainly dealing with a separate issue of prematurity. Now, my learned friend says that it's in paragraphs 25 to 27 and 29, that one finds the inspector's conclusions as to the performance of the appeal scheme against policies SS1 and 4, and the weight to attribute to those policies. Well, I think he added uh, certainly 32. He added 32. And 32. In fact, it was, it was to that paragraph that he went when, when I asked that question directly. Mm -hmm. um, well, at paragraph 32, He's expressly referring, one sees it mirrored in the language, if one looks at paragraph 29, which is in the prematurity section, the final sentence of that is um, that the inspector concludes it wouldn't undermine the fundamental aspect of the strategic balance as a whole. And that language is reflected yes. in paragraph 32, uh, where the inspector finds it wouldn't materially undermine the strategic balance that the council is seeking to achieve. That's a prematurity That's test. a prematurity, because if that's a finding in respect of SS1 and 4, then it's a finding of no conflict. But my learner friend says he clearly did find there was a conflict with SS1 and SS4. He says at 32, the proposal would not materially undermine the strategic balance. So if that's his conclusion as to conflict with SS1 and SS4 and the weight those policies should attract, it appears to be a conclusion that there wouldn't be conflict with those policies because he's saying it wouldn't materially undermine it then. Um, which wouldn't make sense because my learned friend says that the inspector made a clear finding, that's what he says in his skeleton argument, that there would be conflict with those policies. And I say that the reference at 32 is simply a reference back to 29, which is all in the context of prematurity. Well, I understand the point he makes about SS1 um, and the overlap with um, the, the finding about the actual policy and the emerging policy. I understand the point he makes about that, that um, once it's been found that there is a, um, a, a conflict with the actual policy um, and you've afforded weight to it, if there is a striking similarity between the two, he says you don't need to repeat yourself. What at the moment I don't understand is where SL4 comes into it apart from, as you say, passing references about consistency between 4, 5 and 6 in the context of whether or not the plan has reached such an advanced stage as to be afforded um, significant weight, which was your submission. Mm. Well, I say that's missing from the um, inspector's decision letter, that analysis. Um, and we've looked at paragraph 49 of the MPPF. We don't need to turn it up. 
it's behind tab three of the supplementary bundle, if that's helpful. But it, it explains that, an that arguments that an application is premature is unlikely to justify the refusal of permission, other than in limited circumstances. And then it sets out those three considerations which are relevant. Whether a scheme should be refused on grounds of prematurity is different to the question of whether it conflicts with relevant policies of the Emerging Wealth Plan and the weight that should be afforded to those policies. So, for, an exa for example, a decision maker might find that refusal wasn't justified on prematurity grounds because the scheme wasn't so, fund so substantial that it undermined um, the whole plan making process. But that doesn't tell us whether it conflicts with the policy of the emerging plan or what weight that conflict should affect. Yeah, pre prematurity is about prejudice to a process. Yes. Yeah. Um, that is not the same thing you say as a question of conflict, major, minor, or something else, with an emerging policy as such. Precisely, my lord. Precisely so. Um, and furthermore, at paragraph 65 of the skeleton argument, um, my learned friend says, well, a finding that the scheme shouldn't be refused on prematurity grounds means that those emerging policies have already been actively considered and they've been weighed in the balance. But that doesn't hold true if one looks at the way the inspector's decision le letter is expressed, because we've looked already. The, this paragraph 26, he looks at policy SS6 and the weight, no weight. Paragraph 27, he looks at SS5, limited weight. Paragraph 28, he discusses prematurity. Paragraph 29, he discusses prematurity in the context of SS5. And notwithstanding those findings of prematurity, he still comes back in the planning balance to weigh the conflict with SS5 as a factor against the scheme. And he was right to do that. But he should also have done that in respect to policies SS1 and 4. You say one can't second guess, although one might have a reasonably educated view that he might say something very similar in relation to SS4 as he does with 5. There is a world of difference between that and 1. Yes. Because um, 1, as you say, is coloured by the changing landscape. Um, the fact that it's been sort of taken into account, the fact that there is this acute housing need, and notwithstanding that, the policy basically is brownfield sites first. Um, limited outside on the boundary, second, greenfield last resort. Precisely, my lady. And um, yes, and two other points. The boundary has specifically been amended to try and meet yes. more of the NPCS needs. And secondly, policy SS1 was not subject to any modifications <coughs> or comment by the local plan inspector. Now, my learned friend then has a section from paragraph 57 of his skeleton where he discusses the reasons, um, the inspector's reasons. Um, and he makes two points. One is, um, well, given the inspector found conflict with policy 13, he clearly identified that there'd also be conflict with SS1 and 4. And the second, um, which begins at paragraph 59 of his skeleton, it is to allege that any deficiency in the inspector's reasons on SS1 and 4 is attributable to the way the council put its case at the inquiry. I've already, I think, addressed you on the first of those points, um, where I say that a finding of conflict with policy 13 doesn't tell us about what he thinks about SS1 and 4 or the weight they should attract, which is a separate consideration. Um, and I say we're left in the dark as to how that issue is resolved. So as to the second point then, um, this point was run and in my submission rightly respected, uh, rightly rejected um, for the reasons given by Mrs Justice Lang on 101 to 5. And as we explain, if it's correct to say that the um, inspector's decision merely echoed the submissions of the council, he would have adopted the approach we've seen in the council's closing submissions which was to identify conflict with the adopted policy, the weight to attribute to that, conflict with the emerging policies, and the weight to attribute to that. And I would just like to take your lordships, if I may, to a number of references in the council's closing submissions, which make it clear that it wasn't the council's case 
that those emerging policies didn't need to be considered separately because they just carried on the adopted position. The Council's case, I say, is quite clearly that those emerging policies were predicated on a different and new balance which took account of the MPPF and the updated housing need and had been formulated in that context. So it's supplementary bundle tab 19. Beginning on page 150. And this is in the section dealing with conflict with the Emerging Local Plan. So paragraph 30 explains that the Emerging Plan had amended the built-up area boundary to accommodate three additional allocations as part of its approach to leaving no stone unturned in meeting as much as it, uh, of its housing needs as it could. As you say, you put it absolutely bluntly in the final sentence, don't you? In 32? Yes. Yes would conflict with SS4 and run di directly contrary to the spatial strategy, which is SS1. I do. I do, my lady. And, and I explain... And you um, say, as with policy 13. As, as with policy 13, yes, because that's already been discussed, and yeah. so without repeating those submissions. Yes. But what, what I'm making clear at paragraph 31 and 32, where we see that the decision to continue to place the appeal site outside the built-up area boundary has been informed by a robust and detailed evidence base that this isn't just a continuation of more of the same. This is the product of a new, fresh balancing exercise. And paragraph 42 on page 154 refers to all of the evidence that was before the local plan inspector. And I, I should make the point, my lords, that the, the appellant had made extensive submissions to the local plan inspector inviting him to allocate the appeal site for housing, to delete or amend the boundaries of policy SS4, um, and to find that SS1 was unsound because it didn't meet enough of the housing needs. So the council's case here is all of those arguments have already been run before the local plan inspector, and he hasn't said that the policy should be amended uh, in terms of their boundary or their general effect. All he's suggested is minor wording changes. Um, and so that's reflected in paragraph 42. 43, 44 of the council's closing submissions, 49 to 50, but what is clear is that you've addressed each of the emerging policies separately, devoted quite a lot of time to SS5, but not to the exclusion of the others. My lady, yes. And as my learned friend recognised in his detailed grounds of resistance, the party's positions in respect of SS1 was fully explored and canvassed, and the same is obviously true of SS4. And you said in Para 47 that that should attract significant weight, and uh, your opponents were saying the other, 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 otherwise. They were saying limited weight, yeah. clearly identified as a matter in dispute that required resolution by the inspector. As to the question of prejudice on, in respect of reasons, um, we've looked uh, at South Bucks and Porter, and I know it will be familiar. There's just one point that I would like to refer to, if I may, and that authority is tab one. Of the authorities bundle. And at the bottom of page nine, Lord Brown refers to the save case, to Lord, Lord Bridges' judgment in the save case. Mm -hmm. uh, and then over the page, page 10, by E, he sets out an extract from Lord Bridges' judgment. And I recognize um, that the burden of proof lies on the applicant to satisfy the court that it's been substantially prejudiced by failure to give reason. Um, and Lord Bridge, in the save case quoted here, went on to consider circumstances in which a deficiency of reasons would cause substantial prejudice. Um, and the third of those scenarios, which begins just above H, 
is where an opponent of development, whether the local planning authority or someone else, may be substantially prejudiced by a decision to grant permission in which the planning considerations on which the decision is based, particularly if they relate to planning policy, are not explained sufficiently clearly to indicate what, if any, impact they may have in relation to the decision of future applications. And in the present case, now I accept obviously now some time has passed and the emerging local plan has been adopted. Um, but at the time of the decision, the inspector's conclusions in respect of SS1 and 4, I say, and, and how they affected the acceptability of the development were insufficiently explained, the weight wasn't explained at all, and the local authority that had dedicated considerable time and resource, both to the promotion of the local plan and to the defence of an appeal, is entitled, I say, to understand whether the appeal site was considered to conflict with those policies and to understand the weight that any conflict should attract and how that influenced the overall plan balance. And that's missing from the inspector's analysis. Now, I recognise that there are a number of cases which say, provided the substance of the issue is um, fully explained and discussed in the decision letter, then there's no need to specifically refer to the policies or to site policy. Or, um, and we can look at some of those decisions, but the, the substance of the issue in those cases is generally matters relating, for example, to the character and appearance of the area or to the impact on heritage assets. And what the, this, what the courts have said is, well, provided the decision letter explains what the impact on heritage assets are, or how the scheme will impact the character and appearance of the area, they don't then need to say, you know, and therefore conflict with policy X. But here, the difference is that the substance of the issue is whether the site is appropriate for development having regard to the emerging local plan. And that inevitably required consideration and analysis of SS1 and 4 and the weight they should be afforded. Now, in High Court, my learned friend and indeed the advocate for the Secretary of State placed heavy reliance on um, the decision of um, David Elvin QC in the West Oxfordshire case. Um, and I wonder if I might just address you. It has been referred to today, I expect not in such detail, but in the event that it comes back in reply. Well, this was distinguished, wasn't it, by Mr. Justice Lang? Um, it was. Is it worth just picking up what you said and, and yes. see whether there's anything you'd wish really to add to what you yes. said? Um, it was distinguished um, at paragraph 98 of the judgment. And um, halfway down, uh, the judge says, in her judgment, the conclusion in that case was reached in light of the facts in the particular case, which are clearly distinguishable. The judge agreed with counsel for the Secretary of State that the emerging local plan was of marginal importance in the inquiry, wasn't the principal controversial issue, no issue arising under the emerging local plan, which was new and not covered by the existing plan and framework. And she says, in contrast, in this case, the conflict with the emerging plan was the main issue, did add a further dimension for the reasons she set out below. There are, uh, there are a number of discrete points wrapped up in that summary. Um, effectively, in that case, the main issues in the West Oxfordshire case, the main issues were character and appearance, heritage, and whether the adverse impact significantly demonstrably outweighed the benefits. That's at paragraph four. Um, the inspector had identified all of the emerging local policies relative to those issues. He had Included limited weight to the emerging local plan overall. Um, the judge in that case was rather critical of the way the case had been pleaded, um, which didn't identify um, the alleged problems with the inspector's treatment. And one sees that 
um, at paragraph 38 on page 89 of the bundle. Um, only to note that, uh, in general, the, the points taken by the judge was these are new points. They've assumed a significance that they didn't have um, either at the inquiry or at the time of the statement of facts and grounds or, indeed, at the time the skeleton argument was submitted. Um, and effectively, as I mentioned before, the substance of impact on heritage and character and appearance had been properly addressed. Um, and there was no need to refer explicitly to the emerging local policies. And I say that's entirely different from the present case, um, where the substance of the issue was, is it an appropriate location having regard to the emerging local plan? And it plainly was a main issue and was identified in our statement of facts and grounds uh, and our skeleton argument. Those are my submissions on ground one, unless I've missed this further. Could you just help me with this? Um, he identifies at uh, paragraph eight the main issues, and one of them is whether the appeal offers an acceptable location for development having regard to the council's emerging local plan and the effect of the proposed development on local green space. Yeah. And you don't think he answered that issue? I don't, my lord. I don't think he answered that issue because a fundamental element of in answering the question as to whether um, the site offers an acceptable location having regard to the emerging local plan is the spatial strategy um, in the emerging local plan. He deals with the spatial strategy and says very clearly that this is not identified as part of the um, plan anywhere. It's something different and it was identified indeed before as a green gap. So it it fails on every ground, one, four and five. Well my what's, what's the material difference? Mm. What 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 are you what, what's extra that he needed to say? Uh, he says it's not within the strategy, it's reduced to the green gap under the emerging local plan. Um I just don't really see at the moment what else he's supposed to have said. I mean, I quite understand your submission that he's supposed to have mentioned SS1 and SS4 and set them all out. And, uh, but the parties knew all about what they said. And he talks about spatial strategy, which is spatial strategy is to have brownfield and six extra sites, which are not this one. And he says, and I can't remember the paragraph, it's not this one. It's something else. Well, my lord, he in fact, he says those things in the context of the adopted plan. Mm. That's where he says them. And then he says, um, but the reason he uses, or the justification he uses to depart from the adopted local plan is, well, you know, that was adopted at a time when it was understood that the needs could be met within the built-up area boundary. And the housing needs now are very different. And so his findings in respect to policy 13 are predicated on a well. Yes, I I afford it full weight because you know it's. I, mean, I see all that. I, mean, I see all that. But, but I'm just asking really. Yeah. Um, why, if he'd said, which he obviously would have said, if he thought about it, mm. perhaps anyway, that's hard to say. Mm. What if he he um, if he'd said, well, I don't think the identification of six out of town sites in addition to no out of town sites. Um, adds up to uh, beans in the light of the lack of housing, five-year housing supply and the presumption in favour of development, blah, blah, which is what he all refers to. Mm. Um, I just don't see what SS1 and SS4, just to say previously there were no out-of-town sites, now there are different out-of-town sites, yeah. and, and that's part of an emerging local plan, which he deals with and says it's not complete yet, and I give it some lesser weight because of that. I just don't see why the specific reference, mm. having dealt with five, and having sort of dealt with the concept of do you build in an undesignated site that is in a green gap, mm. um, tells the parties anything they didn't already know. Mm. I mean, this is a planning judgment, mm. and I thought this court had said a hundred times, you don't subject them to these kind of minute analyses. Mm. And I, I just wanted to hear what you said about that, because, you know, I'm speaking only for myself, yes. I quite understand, and I, everybody knows I've never been a planning lawyer. <laughs> but 
To me, what mm. you're doing is precisely what my lord and I said you shouldn't do in the case I mentioned earlier, mm. the name of which now escapes me, mm. uh, which is Manslaughter. Manslaughter. Mm. And, and bowing down and saying, didn't mention this, bingo, gotcha. Mm. And, and this is obviously a really serious case for the party, mm. and both parties, mm. you know. And um, doesn't, it, it sounds like you're asking the court to do something um, that uh, is a sort of windfall to the, to mm. the council, really, mm. because the inspector got it a bit, you know, round his neck, is, is what um, maybe it would be said if one was being unfair. Mm. Well, well, I'll make it clear that I, I don't say um, that the inspector had to recite a particular incantation. Um, what I do say is that he identified conflict with the adopted plan. He, he departed from it on the basis of current housing needs, which had already been taken into account in the formulation of the emerging plan. So this policy has well, been looked at. I mean, except that they said you couldn't build, you could build on every blade of grass in the whole area, and you'd never satisfy the housing needs. Well, that's right, I'm afraid, because of the geographical constraints in Worthing with the sea to the well, south the sea, and, the yeah. and the national park to the north. Um, so, so, but what the council had done is. It had re-evaluated, it had gone back, and one sees this in my closing submissions in further detail, it had gone back to all of the sites that its landscape experts had looked at before and rejected, and it said, no, we need to look at those again because of this new exhortation in planning policy to um, meet as much of your housing needs as you possibly can. Um, so it had gone and looked again at all the other sites. It had defended its position in front of the local plan inspector where the um, appellant and other developers were there arguing, no, our site should be allocated, SS1 isn't sound because more housing needs to be met. And that had all been considered afresh in a new I, planning balance. I see all that, but I mean, maybe it's a misunderstanding, maybe it's my misunderstanding. It, even if this local plan has gone through, yeah. um, you still haven't got a five-year land supply or never anything would. like. Never would. And never would. And you've rejected everything, um, all sites except six. Outside the boundary. Mm. Um, so, what is the position if, against that background, the developer applies to the planning commission in another site? It, does the developer have a presumption in favour of planning or not when the, the site has been specifically considered by the plan inspector and rejected? Yes, there's, 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 there's still a presumption yeah. if there's a lack of a five year supply yeah. in any of the in any yeah, event, right. even now the new local plan is adopted. So they can go back and apply again yeah. and still have a presumption. And if the inspector gets it right this time, you will all have been wasting our time. Well, now the emerging local plan has been adopted and it attracts statutory force. I'm yes, planning yes, of course. To that. Um, so that's, that's the difference. So you say it's great weight, weight anyway, so you know you said that. I know Significant weight, I did. You didn't succeed, but mm. you, know, you said that. I did, I said significant yeah. weight. Your, the submission really could be reduced to a very simple proposition, perhaps, could it? I don't know. <coughs> Section 38.6. Make a decision in accordance with the development plan, unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, de development plan policy, here policy 13, given full weight, inspector plan. Position vis-a-vis -vis emerging local plan. Another material consideration. Mm -hmm which you say, in the light of the cases presented, uh, eventuated in an acceptance of conflict with those policies, uh, conceived as they were on a fresh assessment of housing need and how it was to be met. And that is an additional discrete mm -hmm. factor which goes directly to the Section 38.6 policy. That's right, my lord. You submit. That's, I do. I do, my That is ground one. Yeah, that is ground one. I'm grateful. Ground two. Um, now, the impact of development on the setting of the National Park was plainly a principal controversial issue between the parties. Um, we've looked at the Landscape Statement of Common Ground, which is behind tab 18, um, it's which agreed that great weight should be given to conserving and enhancing the landscape and scenic beauty. Mr Peck, who was the Council's planning witness, um, address this, and this is tab 15 of the supplementary bundle. Um, page 
page 111. And it's paragraph 7.52. He refers there to the statutory duty to consider the purposes of the National Park, uh, namely to conserve and enhance the scenic beauty. And he refers to paragraph 176, uh, that great weight should be given to conserving and enhancing the landscape and scenic beauty of national parks, which are afforded the highest status of protection. The statutory duty which he's referring to there is section 11A of the National Parks and Access to Countryside Act. Um, which my learned friend has provided some extracts of. Um, we explained in our statement of facts and grounds that the planning practice guidance makes it clear that that duty in section 11A um, is relevant to considering proposals outside the National Park but that might have an impact on its setting um, and that was an agreed matter as recognised by the judge at paragraph 131 of her judgment. Um, so the first sentence of 176 of the MPPF refers to the great weight being attributed to conserving and enhancing landscape and scenic beauty of the national park. That's a general provision, I say. It relates to all development capable of affecting the landscape and scenic beauty, including that within its setting. And that's because land within the setting of a national park can make an important contribution to its natural and scenic beauty. Um, now, one of the agreed special qualities of the South Downs National Park were, was its breathtaking views. That's identified in the first of the special qualities um, for the South Downs National Park. Now, those special qualities are set out in an appendix to the <coughs> characterization study. I'm afraid you don't have that extract, but I can take you to a reference in the judgment where it's recorded. So first of its special qualities, breathtaking views. Um, the characterization study, the landscape characterization study, um, parts of which we have behind tab 14, um, Um, page 94. Um, page 94, paragraph 2.3, talks about representative views, um, a selection of views drawn up to represent the various types found in the park. Um, including, first bullet point, those that reveal the special qualities of the South Downs. Uh, and then if we look over on page 95, the characterization study specifically refers to viewpoint 31, high downhill. Um, then there are various extracts that aren't included here, but which talk about the objectives uh, in respect of those types of views. Um, so if we could turn, please, to tab 13, which is an extract of the Landscape and Visual Impact Assessment. At page 87. paragraph 2.27. There's a reference there to representative view 31, um, and this is a discussion of the characterization study, and it explains that that view type represents the breathtaking views that are noted in the first of the park's special qualities. So that's just making good to that point that those breathtaking views are part of the special qualities, and the view from high downhill is representative of that special quality. Um, so within the same document then, uh, paragraph 2.29, one of the management aims to ensure that the special qualities are retained 
is to ensure that the development outside the national park doesn't <coughs> block or adversely affect views towards the sea, or adversely affect. From High Down Hill, the view down to the appeal site was a view towards the sea. It was a southerly view. Um, now, the inspector considered impact on views from the national park, um, didn't accept the council's case that the impacts were substantial, but found that they would be moderate at paragraph 45. Um, turning then to the extracts of the landscape and visual impact assessment that I submitted on Monday, um, in the hard copy, this is behind tab two. And it's, it's Appendix J of the Landscape and Visual Impact Assessment, which is a summary of the landscape and visual effects. So this is the appellant's assessment. Um, at Roman numeral page nine, there's a reference to High Down Hill. And there's that finding um, that the impact, at least in the short to medium term, is moderate adverse. That's the impact. And then if one turns to the final page of this document, not the back sheet, but the one before that, this is part of the methodology for the landscape and visual impact assessment. And this explains what those words mean, substantial on the right-hand column, VE3, visual effects. So the range of adverse, or the range of effects are substantial, moderate, slight, negligible, neutral. They could be beneficial or adverse. In this case, we've seen they're adverse. So moderate is proposals that would impact on the view, et cetera, um, readily discernible element. Effectively, it's the second highest rung of harm after substantial. So that was the appellant's analysis of the impact on the view from High Down Hill, which was representative of the park's special qualities in the context where one of the objectives of the National Park was to avoid adverse impacts on views towards the sea. Now, taking up the inspector's decision letter, which is in the core bundle, and the page I'd like to begin at is 223. Well, sorry, 223 has a subheading, setting and views. So we've looked already at paragraph 47, where in the final sentence, the inspector accepts moderate adverse harm, which is reflective of that landscape and visual effect. Then at paragraph 49, final sentence, I don't consider that the setting of the National Park or views from within it, which of course include the view from High Down Hill, would be materially affected. Now, in my submission, what the inspector's doing here is at 47 he's saying, well, it will be moderate adverse. Then he says, in his view, that wouldn't be significant. And then he's discounting it at paragraph 49, not material. And one sees that same approach in paragraph 57. I don't consider it would materially affect the setting of the National Park. Now, my learned friend accepts that the inspector had found there would be harm to the National Park. What he's saying here, it doesn't, doesn't it, he's discounting it. It's, it's not material, not relevant to his decision in my submission. And, and then when he comes to his planning balance, there is no discussion of that. And I appreciate what my learned friend says in respect to paragraph 84. And I'd ask your lordships to look. So the inspector, having considered the impact on the National Park, on page 224, he goes on to look at localised impact. And he does so in respect to a number of vantage points. So paragraph 51, he looks at views from Goring Street. Final sentence, moderate advert. Paragraphs 52 to 53, he looks at views from Little Hampton Rose, Little Hampton Road. Final sentence of paragraph 53, substantial adverse. 
paragraph 54, he looks at views from the site to the national park. And 55, substantial adverse. So these are all views that don't relate to the setting of the national park. They're localised views. And there's a finding of moderate, substantial, and substantial from various local viewpoints. So then when he draws together the, his findings at paragraph 57, I don't consider the National Park Blue material affected, reflecting what he says at 49. Effectively, I said discounting that harm or leaving it there. Um, then he says, over the page, I have found that the proposal would adversely, have, would adversely impact on the number of visual receptors and re result in some further harm, and I come back to that in the planning balance. And that's the reference to his finding on the localised impact. So you say that doesn't relate to 49 at all? No. Well, I say that at 49, what he's doing is discounting any harm to the National Park. He's yes, saying yes, not so materially affected. I get that. Yeah. But you're saying that the sentence, of, the penultimate sentence of 57 yeah. is, is really only directed at localised impact. I do. Yeah. Yeah. So doesn't the term visual in and receptors to all visual receptors. Well, my lord, it? well, my lord, it, it can, but here the inspector quite separately deals with various aspects of landscape harm. He deals with the landscape value of the gap first, page two, two, three. Then he deals with the setting of the national park and views within it, and then he deals with localized views. And what I say, and I'll come on to make this good by reference to authorities, but I say that impacts on the national park required a particular treatment, care, analysis, weight to be attributed to them. They're not just, they're not the same as any visual impact on undesignated landscape. And one sees that para paragraph 84 then, page 230, the proposal would also involve the loss of best and most versatile land and would have an adverse impact on a number of visual receptors. Now, if by that sentence he's wrapping up harm to the setting of the South Downs National Park, a statutorily designated um, landscape with other generalised local impacts outside the National Park, then I say that's a wholly inadequate um, treatment of, of the landscape harm to the South Downs National Park. He doesn't mention the setting of the National Park in his planning balance. He doesn't mention the National Park at all in his planning balance. And that's, I say, because he's discounted that at 49 by saying that's, that's, that's consistent with your interpretation of para 49. Yes. Because if one looks at 49, it appears as if he's saying, well, moderate adverse harm, but actually it's de minimis, so I'm discounting it completely. Yes. And that's what I say he does again at 57 when he yeah. talks to the National about the National Park, and then he comes on to impact on local views, and he has found some substantial adverse impacts on local views. The, the, what, what you're really asking us to accept in this, if we come back to 47 to 49, mm. I may have misunderstood this, but you confirm or deny this. Um, when he says, I concur with the appellant that the level of harm would be moderate, adverse, and not significant, You are submitting, are you, that that's irreconcilable with the statement at the end of paragraph 49? I do. Rationally irreconcilable. I do. And I made that submission before the learning judge and she accepted it. Um, I, I say that if it, at 47, he's accepting moderate harm. We've seen where that falls on the scale. Yeah. Um, at 49, he's saying he's, he's discounting it. He's saying not, no material, not, not relevant material relevance to his decision um, and he's discounting it there and that is not rationally compatible with his finding at 47 that there would be a moderate level of harm. He, he says at the end of 49 um, he, we haven't really focused on this point but it might be worth doing so mm. now he refers both to the setting mm. and to the views yeah. disjunctively he does um, is it possible to read the end of 47 being directed to particular views, which mm. he's going to say, but not necessarily producing a conclusion 
at the setting of the poll? In my submission, no, my lord, and my learned friend didn't make that argument. You asked him about that, and his position was that the inspector had found harm to the setting of the Southlands National Park, not just to a view. Um, and, and he accepts that in a number of places. Um, and I can uh, give your lordship some references. His case is that the inspector um, was of the view that the, har that the harm to High Down Hill was harm to the setting of the South Downs National Park. And that's the way it was presented. That was the focus of all of the evidence, was the impact on that view, which was an important part of the setting, recognised um, as one of the special qualities, those breathtaking views. So what, what my learned friend says, for example, um, I'll give, I'll give mm. you the references. So in his skeleton argument to the High Court, Court Bundle, page 153, paragraph 5.31, he refers to the inspector's finding of moderate harm and he says it's manifestly clear and obvious that harm to the South Downs National Park was properly assessed and taken into account. So not just, okay, well, impact on one view, but no, no actual harm to the national park taken as a whole. Um, para 5.32 of that same skeleton argument, which is core bundle, page 153. The inspector plainly took full account of the extent of the harm to the South Downs National Park. In his detailed grounds of resistance, call bundle page 107, paragraph 5.27. This is the this is, um, detailed grounds of resistance. Detailed grounds of resistance, yep. So page 107 of the call bundle, paragraph 5.27. He referred to Section 11A, Duty, and Para 176 of the framework and said they don't require no detriment. As here, there can be harm that doesn't render the development unacceptable, i.e. accepting harm to the South Downs National Park through harm to its setting. So it's never been the appellant's case, either at appeal or below or here, that, OK, well, there was harm to one view, but that didn't materially affect the setting. Analysis, his thinking is this is about a sea view. Um, it's the sea is is very dominant, and um, so you're looking from the top of that hill um, down into the a, a built-up area basically, mm. and a little bit more built. I mean, I'm being um, layman. Yes, here. understood. But uh, you know, a, a built-up area is. It's a massive built-up area. Anybody who knows this area knows precisely what it looks like. It's a teeming sea, sea of humanity. Mm. And um, the, v the view is really the sea. Mm. And that's what he says several times, as uh, Mr. Cairns pointed out. So what he's saying is that the setting of the, of the national park and views from within it, despite the fact that technically it's what he said in 47, mm. Actually, because of that, it doesn't make that much difference. Mm. And um, that was obviously his view. Mm. I mean, he went up there, he had a look, he did all the other things he was supposed to do. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's hard to say that when you can put those logical set of reasons together that it's irrational nonsense. It's just badly expressed. Well, isn't it? Two points, my lord. First, it would be very difficult, given the high vantage from high downhill, for any development to block the view of the sea. Yes, it's indeed impossible. Yeah, absolutely, indeed impossible. I mean, that's what I was thinking. Yes. It was rather funny it, thing be, to it, suggest. It would be impossible. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the second point is, does it adversely affect the quality of the views? And the finding is, yes, it does. Yes, and all obviously, of, again. And all, and all those points that your lordship has just made, um, well, you know, there's already existing development and it's viewed in the context they're already wrapped up in the landscape and visual impact assessment 
um, document which we looked at before, which sets out all of those very same points, all of the very same points that said proposed development would op occupy the middle. How would, how would he properly, I mean, I, I completely get all this, how would he properly have, I mean, could he properly have reached the conclusion yeah. that it was moderate adverse, but mm -hmm. it didn't matter? Well, what he could have done was he could have reached the conclusion it was moderate adverse, taken that into the planning balance, attributed it weight in accordance with paragraph one. Said it's not as much weight as the need for housing or whatever. Yeah, yeah. He, it was a factor that had so to be weighed. Been. It could have My lord, of course it could have been. Yeah. Paragraph one seven six does not preclude any development Just that wasn't. harms that, that harms the setting of the of the national park. I mean, you can see why, if you don't mind my saying so, um, the startled despite your excellent argument, I balk at the conclusion, which is that because the inspector is just a planner, I mean, that's not rude, but he's just a planning expert, mm. doesn't think like a lawyer, um, these, lord, these developers don't get something that he mainly wanted them to have. Well, my lord, I, I, I'll take you to some of the authorities. This is very familiar territory to just planners. Refer to the inspector, Sorry? he is a solicitor. He's, yeah. a he's a solicitor. He's a well, solicitor. I mean, even, even lawyers are not all perfect. I mean, some <laughs> judges fall into traps. Of, well, I, I mean, we have that. appeals here from judges. My, my lord, Sometimes we allow them. My, my, lord, <laughs> this, my lord, this 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 policy framework is well known to just planners and to planning lawyers. It, yes. it, it requires a stage process, and um, what has to happen in the planning balance and what does happen in respect of all of the other harms the inspector has found is that you get to the end and you put them all in the balance and you reach a view and of course the inspector could have put this harm to the national park in the balance he should have afforded it great weight um, and that could legitimately if or reason, reasonably be expected to have influenced his decision mm. but he didn't he didn't and and that is that, that's it i think i think i think i get it yeah I wonder if I might just a couple of points, a couple of additional points. The PPG ex Planning Practice Guidance Extract that my learned friend referred to um, earlier, which is set out uh, on page 10 of his skeleton argument. Sorry, do you want us to go to the original document? Um, I, I'm looking at the replacement skeleton argument with the references, and I'm not sure. Oh, if you have, I, I'm happy to. Just I think we've got the PPG somewhere. Oh, you've got tab four in the supplementary. Tab four. Is that the picture? I'm grateful. Um, Page nine. Yes, yes, indeed. Thank you. Um, yes, so it's it's actually the part on page ten. And my own friend relied on this a number of times earlier today, um, and he says that in his skeleton argument, paragraph 73, that it's only significant harm that should be avoided. Uh, and he uses the PP planning practice guidance to support that argument. And if we look at the planning practice guidance, all it says is that poorly located or designed development in the setting of a national park can do significant harm. That's self-evidently true. But it doesn't mean that anything less than significant harm can be left out of account. And I say that any harm to the national park should be weighed in the balance against the scheme, having regard to what's said at paragraph 176. And I wonder, there are a number of authorities on the national park um, issue and impacts, and I wonder if I might just address you on a couple of those, and I'll try to do it briefly in my time. Um, so, I think my learned friend took you to Bayliss, which is behind tab three of the authorities bundle. Um, okay, this was a court appeal decision um, from the judgment of Mr. Pickenbottom. Uh, one sees the number of pertinent points here. Paragraph 5, site 800 metres outside the area of outstanding natural beauty. Paragraph 6, the inspector's main issues did not include impact on the area of outstanding natural beauty. Paragraph 11 um, sets out the first ground which was related to the inspector's treatment of the AONB. 
which we've just seen was not a main issue. Um, paragraph 13, the claimant or appellant argues that the decision maker needs to treat impacts on the AOMB as something more than just landscape generally. Sorry, what, what's your point about this case? My point, the about, submission? my point about this case is um, relates to the approach to the uh, national parks and the need to attribute great weight to any harm that's found to... I don't think anybody has admits that that's not true. Well, I think, I think we got out of Mr. Cairns in the end, well, but you did have to attribute great weight. My Lord, I confess that I thing. anticipated there to be, um, before lunch, uh, agreement with Mr. Cairns that great weight must be attributed to any harm. And after lunch, uh, a slight divergence from that, in which he said any weight can be attributed to it. If it's a small amount of harm, then limited, no, moderate, whatever weight can be attributed to it. Well, I mean, OK, I understood great plus a little is less serious than great plus a lot. Mm, well, yes, I mean, that. if it's a small amount of harm and it's attributed great weight, but recognising it's there's a small no amount... There's no magic in the word great there's weight, no, anyway. No, there's, there's no magic in the word, Lynn, but my submission is there is a duty to attribute great weight, particular weight, to a finding of harm to the National Park. And I say that the authorities are supportive of that position. Um, it's not right to treat landscape and visual impacts generally in undesignated landscapes in the same way that you do um, designated landscapes. And for example... No, well you've made that point. You say yeah. he, he lumped them together wrongly. Yeah, and I make that point, if I may, just briefly, by reference... But, but just a moment, if yeah. I may. Um, are you uh, asking us to diverge from what Sir David said in Bailey? Well, um, what I'm saying is that in Bayliss there was a careful consideration of the impact of the development on the area of outstanding natural beauty, which was considered and treated separately from general landscape impacts and addressed separately in the planning balance. Um, and, the inspect um, and the judge found that that showed that it had been given particular care and importance um, over and above landscape impacts generally. Right. Um, particular care and importance is not yeah. the concept we're dealing with. Well, uh, The concept we're dealing with is great weight. Yeah. Um, and there is, according to Sir David, effectively, I paraphrase what he said, a, a scale or range there of is. weights that mm. can properly satisfy the policy requirement, as I understand what he said. Mm. Uh, and, and I agreed with that, I think, in Montreal, <laughs> though this wasn't the, the issue in Montreal. Um, and he effectively said that weight would be uh, variable according to the particular circumstances of the case. Mm. Now, is that not the right approach? Well, I say um, that in a designated landscape, um, harms must attract uh, a weight that is commensurate with their status as designated landscapes. Well, and that's, that's, that's what he said. Yeah. Well, well, he said it would be commensurate with the level of harm. That's a slightly different. Well, in the context of it all being st having a status. Yeah. I mean, so paragraph one seven four of the MPCF, which we have behind tab today, the supplementary bundle, says. Planning decision should contribute to an enhanced natural environment by protecting and enhancing valued landscapes in a manner commensurate with their statutory status or identify quality in a development plan. Mm. And then paragraph 176 tells us that national parks, as well as AOMBs, have the highest status of protection yeah. in relation to these areas. So must be protected in a manner commensurate, these have the highest status. And I say that that has to be reflected in, in the weight that any harm to such designated landscapes is accounted for in the planning balance. And it has to be, it has to be given, if you had the same impact, say a moderate impact on a designated and an undesignated landscape, you'd have to give more weight right. to the designated. What, what about this formulation? You see whether it serves your argument. Yeah. Be bearing in mind that your primary submission is that no weight was given. Yes, that is no my primary Actually, submission. no weight was given. No weight. To the harm identity. Um, your submission, that submission says perfectly well, doesn't it, that the proposition that the inspector must approach his or her task conscious of the impact. 
imperative that great weight must be given to the conservation of the landscape beauty of the National Park. I leave that unnecessarily open. Yes. Um, and that if that is not evident in the approach taken, yeah. uh, then the decision maker fails to understand and fails properly to apply policy in paragraph 126. And you say that when the decision maker has found clearly identified harm mm. in the setting of national parks, um, simply to give it no weight, negligible weight, does not evince that, that approach. I do, my lord. Simply to give it no or negligible weight, or even to wrap it up with the weight that he's attributed to visual impacts or non designated and actually, I don't think your argument needs to go any further than that. It doesn't need to go any further than that, my lord. There's one correction I would like to make. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it was inadvertent, but it was to my learned friend's submission in respect of how. And you'll recall that you asked him um, before lunch if the judge had ex referred to any policy that dealt with great weight. Um, and he took you back to um, a paragraph in it which referred to paragraph 116 of the previous opinion. Paragraph 116 does not, did not contain the requirement to attribute great weight. That was paragraph 115. Mm. Um, and I don't believe that is referred to in how. And Mrs. Justice Lang makes that very point when she um, discusses how. At what paragraph? At what paragraph does Mrs. Justice Lang? She deals with it, my lord. Bear with me. I'm grateful. I'm very grateful. Yes. Um, she says at 135, the judgment in Howe makes no mention of the policy requirement to give great weight to conserving and enhancing landscape and scenic beauty. That's now in paragraph 176, but it used to be in paragraph 115, not 116. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Unless I can assist you further, there's an answer. Thank you very much. Indeed, Ms. Carpool and Mr. Ken.
in the planning balance in 84. Of course, I don't propose to say any more on that. Uh, just uh, the, <coughs> the only final matter on ground two, by the way, is when I was making my submissions, I made reference to the learned judge's identification of great weight being indicated in the submissions made by the council, paragraph 99 for reference. Um, and uh, I indicated, or I may have made a mistake about that, uh, but in retrospect I haven't. And that is at divider 19, page 166. Uh, and that is the reference the council made in its closing as to the harm to the setting of the national park. The following paragraph, where great weight is referenced, that is in the context of heritage impacts. So it was not referenced in the council's closing statement. Um, and uh, so I, I, I retract my correction, as it were, to that extent. Uh, dealing with ground one, just in answer to Maloney Friends. It's just, uh, again, a very few matters. Um, uh, when one goes to the decision letter itself, I'd invite you to turn that up, please. Obviously, you'll make a decision as to whether SS1 was um, subsumed, as we say, within SS4 and the references therein. Um, but it is also important I think, to note what the inspector said um, at the beginning of the appeal decision. Paragraph 6 is important, and I think this was alluded to earlier on today, um, namely that during the course of the inquiry there was overlapping, I, I think uh, Lady Justice and Andrews actually made a point about the overlapping um, element of uh, the policies. Uh, but of course it's clear before he identified the main issues that the inspector noticed that the effect of the proposed development on local green space was inextricably linked to the acceptability of the local uh, of the need of the location, the need for housing and the council's emerging plan, and I've dealt with them together below. Also it's important I ask you to note paragraphs fourteen and fifteen as the case that was presented by the respondent, both in the High Court and here, was that somehow or other there was a different balance. There was a different balance being undertaken in the context of the spatial strategy. But at 14 and 15, it's clear the inspector was fully aware of that. He says, I, I noticed that the local policy context, page 219 of the bundle, in yours it would be the local policy context was one in which it was considered that all of the borough's housing requirements could be delivered within the existing um, built-up area boundary. In my view, the existing and adopted policy um, 13 seeks to achieve a similar balance. Uh, and he there, there expressly acknowledges and recognises the different policy context in which the adopted development plan had been formulated. Uh, and it's on that basis he um, overall considers that the adopted development plan uh, remains one of the cornerstones, uh, sorry, policy 13 is one of the cornerstones of the adopted local plan. And uh, he gave it full weight. Uh, that. Um, insofar as, I think it's the penultimate Insofar as the prematurity argument has been uh, canvassed by Melinda Crenz, again, I, I'd ask you to uh, note that what the framework says in paragraph 48 um, is how a decision maker is to approach the weighting in 
the context of the stage at which, at which a development plan and its policies uh, are when he or she calls to make that decision. And of course, in this case, they were all at the same stage. We'd and had the EIP. We were at the same stage. That, well, the, local, the emerging local plan was at a stage which was agreed in the Statement of Common Ground to require further steps before it would be legally compliant and before it could be adopted. So, so what's your point? So my point on that, um, uh, my lord, is that it's a waiting exercise which he was fully cognizant of that it would have encompassed all of the policies in the emerging local plan. It's another layer to my argument that he covered it with the space uh, in paragraph 27 and 29 when he talks about the overall spatial strategy. And finally, um, my lord, the, um, the only other matter was uh, there was some discussion this afternoon about, well, the inspector had to determine whether there was conflict with the emerging local uh, and therefore what weight to be given. It was never an issue that there was conflict with the emerging local plan, and for your note, uh, that is before you uh, in any event um, in Mr. Hutchison's evidence, and that's at divider 1143. Of the, that's of the supplementary bundle. It's page 43 at divider right. 11, my lord. Thank you. And, and what Mr. Hutchison does with all his evidence, he did it in respect of each of the issues that were discussed. He provides the meat, um, and then what he does is done as a summary. Um, and uh, at eight, as I, as I thought I'd indicated before, the reason we're here is that we weren't allocated. We weren't in accordance with the emerging local plan. So it was... Um, it was agreed that we conflicted, uh, where it says the fact the site is not allocated, allocated and does not accord with the emerging local plan policies as currently drafted means very little when viewed through, through these optics, uh, and the optics were the weight effectively to be given to it. It's also confirmed <coughs> uh, at page 57. We've actually referred to this page previously because that's where he indicated to the inspector the cases advanced by the appellant that a great weight was attached to conserving and enhancing the landscape, but in the present case it couldn't be carried out, it could be carried out without any significant harm. And the paragraph um, I refer to in this context though is 8.45, where it's actually highlighted that it would be in conflict with the emerging local plan. So of course it's in that context one has to consider overall whether indeed the inspector addressed those emerging plan policies and the way to be given to them in substance, which we say, for the reasons I indicated this morning, uh, he did. But uh, I, I'm not going to go through my submissions again uh, unless there's anything specific that has been raised that I can assist with um, as opposed to close my case. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ms. Tarpo, and your juniors, uh, we will take time to consider our judgments. When we uh, deliver them, you'll get a draft, but please only make typographical corrections. Use those drafts only for the purpose of agreeing an order and the disposition and costs, and um, there'll be no need to attend at the remote handout. Thank you all very much. An interesting day.